Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all today. How's everyone doing? <laughs> well, it's great to be here. My name is Nancy. I'm one of the pastors here at Lighthouse Christian Church, and we're just so glad and honored to be able to participate and worship together in person. And if you're joining us online, we just want to send a big welcome to you as well. Um, here at Lighthouse, our hope and our prayer and our mission is to share God's grace and truth so that people everywhere will come to know, love, and serve Jesus. So I hope that you'll find Lighthouse just a place where you can draw closer to God as we draw closer to one another as well. Um, this morning, we'll have the privilege of celebrating communion. And so uh, if you are uh, participating with our worship at home, we just want you to prepare uh, some bread or crackers and some juice as well. And here uh, we also have some communion packets in the back. We just invite you to make sure you pick one up and, and have that ready for you. Um, yeah, as we get, get ready for worship, we're just, let's just prepare our hearts and I'll lead us in a word of prayer. Okay, will you just join me today? Heavenly Father, we come just with thankful hearts knowing that this is a safe and warm place where we can gather together to worship you, to declare your goodness, your righteousness, your reign over this world, and that we can belong to you. We can be part of your kingdom. We can be part of your family. We can receive just your love and grace in our lives and your strength and power for us to to live lives that honor you, that honor one another, that, that declare your goodness and the hope that we have in you. Lord, there is so much going on in our world today and even in the midst of this pandemic, Lord, where there are so many losses, where there are fears, where there are troubles, where there's disunity, where people have still been out of work, where people are suffering from illness, God, would you pour out your spirit on our lives that we might be people of hope, people of love, people who reach out, people who care, people who share that there is a God who loves them and that we can know him and we can be filled with his power to love and to bring hope to others. Lord, we pray that your spirit would fill us up, that we would be a transforming presence in this world by our words and by our deeds and by the way that we love one another and by the way that we reach out to serve and to help those in need. So Lord, this morning, would you speak to us? Would you give us your words of hope and life that we might treasure them in our hearts and that we might live them out in our lives? So we thank you and praise you this morning in Jesus' name, amen. stand with us as we sing our first song.
That is our prayer, Lord. While your church is built, Lord, here in this place, speak to us, O oh God. this time we'll release our kids age 2 to 13. But please continue to maintain a posture of worship. Let's worship our God and continue to give him praise, the praise that he deserves.
thank you, Lord, that we can come before you, enjoy these moments to turn our eyes toward you and focus our attention upon you. Thank you, Lord, that you draw near to those that would draw near to you. And thank you that you desire to speak to every person who's open and receptive to you. And I pray today that we would all be among them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. If you're here, have a seat. Thanks. Well, what a great thought that we uh, enter into this message with, none but Jesus. And there's no one like Jesus, and we need him uh, most of all. And thankfully, he's here. Thankfully, he loves us. And thankfully, he wants to reach out to us and draw us near to himself. But also, he wants to use us. And we're in a series of messages right now, a collection of messages called Enduring Leadership. And I um, have been drawing these messages primarily from the book of 1 Timothy and, and now 2 Timothy. And when you think about enduring leadership, it's a little bit of a play on words. Like uh, enduring leadership could mean just leadership that lasts, leadership that can endure through the troubles and trials and discouragements that inevitably accompany uh, leadership. So leadership that can endure through maybe suffering and setbacks and discouragement. Uh, and who are going to be the people that can endure in leadership. Incidentally, when I talk about leadership, I'm really talking about you. Uh, leadership is about influence. And each of us, God has put us in a position uh, to influence others, whether our, by our walk or by our talk, <laughs> whether by our position or without a position, uh, whether it's peers or family or people we work with. But God wants to use you, which means if God's going to use you, you, you need to become we need to become people of influence. And when you think about it, we're always influencing people one way or another, whether we're conscious of it or not. But we need to become people of influence, and that's what in enduring leadership is about. Of course, sometimes enduring leadership, it could be taken in a very negative sense, in the sense of if you're under unhealthy leadership, dysfunctional leadership, and you just say, how can I endure this leadership? How can I endure these leaders? <laughs> I hope that's not what you're thinking, but I know that sometimes it's true. We are in organizations or sometimes even churches uh, where the leadership is not healthy and we have to endure and, and learn how to thrive in a situation with less than ideal leadership. I hope that's not our problem. Uh, as you know, or most of you know, that we're preparing for a leadership transition in our church. Uh, at the end of May, I'll be stepping down as lead pastor and then handing over the, the leadership reins to the staff, but especially to Pastor Joe, who's going to be our lead pastor starting June 1st. And I'm excited about that. Um, you know, I have some mixed feelings. I have some sadness and nostalgia and all that too. But I, I'm excited about the, the man that God has raised up to be a, our next leader for our church. Uh, okay, let's talk about enduring leadership. And this message is called Liberated by God's Word. But I also want to add this, Liberated by God's Word and God's Servants. Because I do want to talk today about God's servants, which is anybody who desires to serve God and offer up their lives and make themselves useful in the master's hand. You know, if you want to be a, a vessel for, for God to work through, then I hope you'll really pay attention to this message because it's about how God wants to use his servants to help and change the world. Now, I want to start here. We're going to look primarily at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, but I want to start at the end of it, just to give you a, a, a little context here. At the end of chapter 2, and, and you'll remember that this is Timothy uh, writing from prison in the last days of his life. He knows that he's awaiting uh, uh, execution. And so in his kind of his last will and testament, he's writing to this uh, young pastor named Timothy that, that Paul has sort of mentored and coached and, and raised up. He's, Timothy's kind of like Paul's prime protege. And now Timothy is leading the church at Ephesus. So Paul writes these, this letter largely to tell Timothy, hey, come, come and see me because I'm not going to be around much longer. And also to instruct and equip Timothy about how to lead well, how to uh, model a leadership that endures. We also talked about how the church at Ephesus, where Timothy has been called to lead, is a troubled church. There's a lot of false teaching and some dissension and and heretics that are having a negative influence in the church. And that's the backdrop for this here. So what I want us to see, first of all, and this is my first point, is people are held captive to the evil one. People are held captive to the evil one. 
And look with me at the end of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. It says, opponents, and these are the false teachers, people that are creating havoc in the church, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. And, okay, in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Uh, to me, you know, I, I read that, I study that, I think, that's a startling statement that basically there are people, even people within the church, who have been trapped by the devil, and he has taken them captive to do his will. So we know that, you know, ultimately we want to do God's will, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. But this is saying that actually some people can be tricked or trapped by the devil, and that they are not doing God's will, but they're actually doing the bidding of the evil one could be within the church or outside of the church. So that's my first point. People are held captive to the evil one, and that's why they and we need liberation. Uh, Jesus talked about this, you know, in John 8, verses 31 to 36. I want to look at there for a moment. In, John, in Jesus' ministry, he has, you know, a lot of uh, contention with some people, and sometimes, you know, they get in some really engaging, fascinating conversations. And here's a snippet of one of those conversations. This is John 8, 31 to 36. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Okay, now, the setting is Jews who believed in him. So these are not the hostile Jews, but these are Jews that are coming to learn about him and starting to believe in him, and uh, maybe they're, they're learning about becoming a disciple, and I hope that you you know, are also learning about and serious about becoming a disciple. A disciple is simply a follower of Jesus. So I think technically, or theoretically at least, every Christian is a disciple, a follower of Jesus. However, do you know Christians who are not really following Jesus or not even concerned about that? Uh, so we, we see this discrepancy between Christians and disciples. But I think biblically there's to be no discrepancy. A, a true Christian is a follower of Jesus. Okay, so Jesus says this, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. A very famous verse, right? John 8, 32. And they answered him, and, the, and these are Jewish people that are dialoguing with him. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. I don't know why they say that. They were slaves in Egypt for 400 years, but I don't know. They're not thinking clearly, maybe. But he says, they say, how can you say that we'll, we shall be set free? And here's Jesus' answer. I love this. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. That's why we say sin is the ultimate deadly addiction. We don't just play with sin, trifle with sin, or excuse our sin. Sin is, uh, is the ultimate deadly addiction. Jesus says, whoever sins, and at times that's probably all of us, but he says, when you sin, as you sin, you become the slave of sin. You become enslaved. You place yourself under the power of sin. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now a lot of us have heard these two really famous verses. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. People love to quote that totally without any context or any reference to Jesus. But it comes from Jesus in this context. He wants to set you free. And then uh, verse 36, so if the son sets you free, you will be free Indeed. What I want us to capture today is that uh, we are all, apart from Christ, captured to sin and captive to the evil one. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, we're told this, the God of this age, which is another way to refer to the evil one or Satan um, or the devil, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel. This is one of the reasons why we think, well, how come people aren't coming to faith, and why aren't they coming to Christ, and why don't they just open their heart? And, and one of the reasons is right here. In some cases, perhaps in many cases, the God of this age, the evil one, has blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they can't understand. Uh, they cannot see how good God is. They can't see how real he is. And so we got to pray for them that, that, you know, God liberates them and, and opens their eyes and overcomes the work of, of the evil one who's always trying to blind the minds of unbelievers. 
The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. 1 Peter 5, verse 8 uh, tells us, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It's a stark reminder to us that we do have an enemy. Your enemy, the devil, is prowling around just looking for someone that he can attack and devour, capture, maybe blind their eyes, harden their hearts, uh, turn them off to Christianity through the bad witness of some hypocritical Christians. Uh, the, the, the God of this age, the, the devil, prowls around just looking for people to attack, which means you're vulnerable, we're vulnerable, apart from the, the resources that we gain through the Spirit of God. All right, so um, I just want us to see these things. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So don't give him an opening. Don't give him a foothold in your life. Ephesians 6.12, a very famous verse, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I want you to catch that. There are powers of this dark world that are influencing our world. There are uh, spiritual forces of evil from the heavenly realm that are influencing the earthly realm. So we need to realize this, that the battle that we face is not just flesh and blood. It's not just human will and free will and trying to convince people to open their hearts to God and, and to learn about Jesus and to follow Jesus. We, we, we definitely are engaged in that enterprise, but we're reminded here that this is definitely a spiritual battle that we're in. And apart from the spiritual weapons of God's word and prayer, we are really uh, helpless. It's like going into battle, but oh, I forgot my armor, I forgot my weapon. 1 John 3, 8 says this, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil. Right? Like Jesus said, right? Everyone who sins becomes a slave to sin. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And then I want you to catch this, a great verse in 1 John 3, 8. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. So this is the picture that we're getting uh, from biblical theology is that uh, the world in a sense is in darkness. We know this from Genesis three and the fall and the rebellion of humanity against humankind, the uh, expulsion from the garden of Eden, the, the garden of paradise. And that ever since then, we've been trying to find our way back to God and God has been reaching out to draw us back to him. But this is a kind of a stark picture of our world apart from Christ. There's darkness, there's evil, there's satanic power trying to harden people's hearts, trying to draw them away, trying to uh, keep them captive. And so what's needed? What's needed is liberation. What's needed is liberation. What's needed is freedom. God's rescue mission. And really, that's why Jesus came. He says here, I, I came to destroy the, the works of the devil. He came to bring the kingdom of God, which is the rule of God. That in, in, a, in a world that has been largely ruled by evil powers, Jesus has come to bring the rule of God so that people can come to him, become citizens of that kingdom, uh, become followers of Jesus, which means they're going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And therefore, we then become the citizens of the kingdom, even while we live in this world that is often in spiritual darkness. And the citizens of the kingdom are supposed to stand up, step out, speak up with the truth of God and the grace of God, to share God's grace and truth. So people would come to know him, love him, serve him. That's our mission. So what's needed is liberation. And God has set in motion his rescue mission. It's the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, when Jesus embarked on his public ministry, one of the first things he said in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, he said, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near or drawn near or is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, that's the movement that God set in motion. And what's our role if you're a follower of Jesus? What's our role in this great liberation movement? And here's where I want to take us back to 2 uh, Timothy uh, chapter 2. Again, at the end, we're reminded that there are people who are trapped by the devil and have been taken captive to do his will. So what's our role? Well, here's what God is going to do, and here's what he's been doing, and he's doing today, and here's how God wants to use us. God wants to raise up disciples who will carry out his mission, who will carry out his mission of rescue and redemption 
and liberation. Here's how chapter 2 starts, 1 Timothy chapter 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, this is one of, if you're a disciple, this is one of the most important verses in the New Testament. I hope we'll at least catch this. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, really tells us how the mission of God is going to go forward. Paul, and he's kind of, you know, near the end of his life, near the end of his ministry, and, and he's uh, entrusting to Timothy the gospel, the good news of, of God, the good news of the kingdom, the good news that the world needs that will change the world, that begins to restore the world to God's intended purpose. And so he says, the things you've heard me say, me, Paul, in the presence of many witnesses, you, Timothy, entrust those things to reliable people. Because what I've taught you, you teach to others, right? So that's, this is where we come in. You say, well, well, what's my role? How can I really make a difference? Here's what you can do. You can keep learning and be a good student of God's word and God's truth, and then take what you learn and teach it to others. Pass it on. Share it in a Bible study. Uh, share it in your testimony. Share it in conversation. Share it through your lifestyle, but not just through your works, but through your words. So the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses... You, Timothy, entrust that to reliable people who will be qualified to teach others. Now, what you see in this one verse, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, is four generations of Christians, right? Paul, Paul learns from Jesus, and then Paul passes it on to Timothy, and then he tells Timothy, I want you to entrust the things I've taught you, the things you've learned, I want you to pass it on to other people and look for reliable people to, to give it to. And then those reliable people will be qualified to teach others as well. So, four generations of, of disciples, right? Paul to Timothy, Timothy to Timothy's students, and then Timothy's students become teachers themselves and pass it on to others. This is how the kingdom goes forward. This is how the gospel is advancing into the world. So that, you know, we see four generations in that one verse, but, but those generations have continued on all throughout church, church history, 2,000 years now. And each of us, if, you're, if you know Jesus... In a sense, you're the beneficiary of somebody who did 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, right? Somebody who took what they learned, and they shared it, and then you grasped it, and then hopefully God is using you to help pass it on to other people. I'm so thankful for the people who did that in my life. A lot of you know, uh, when I was growing up, my parents were not believers. They were not Christians, but they did send us... Uh, me and my, my brother and my two sisters, they did send us to Sunday school, a Christian Sunday school, because they thought we would learn some good morals and good ethics <clears throat> and uh, have some good training. And they also wanted us to go to a, an Asian church because they wanted us to meet some other Asian kids. So all of that happened. Uh, but what I, what I realized is that once you come to Jesus, and I didn't come to Jesus, you know, till I'd been in Sunday school for, I don't know, 10 years or something. <clears throat> but when I came to Jesus, I signed up to become his follower. That's what it means to come to Jesus, right? You, you believe in him, you accept him. Maybe a lot of us, we pray to prayer, Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life. But you realize when you pray that prayer, he doesn't come into your life just to dabble. He comes into your life to take over, right? He is to be there, are my savior, but my Lord. Sometimes people say, well, can, can Jesus be my savior, but not my Lord? Because I'm not sure about the Lordship issue. And you know what? It's, it's one Jesus. <laughs> if you accept him, you accept him as your savior and your Lord. So I like to think of it this way. It's not just accepting Jesus, like, oh yeah, I accept you. But it's giving my life to him. So whatever you did when you accepted Jesus, if you have not given your life to him, I want to encourage you. I want to urge you. I want to exhort you to do that now, to do that today. Because that's what it means to be a believer. It's to be a follower of Jesus. He gives himself to me, right? Jesus gave his life for me so that he could give his life to me and now live his life through me. So when you accept Jesus, you're accepting him into your heart, into your life as your savior and your Lord. So I don't know, for some of us today, maybe that's the lesson. We've got to wrestle with that. You know, have I given my life to Jesus? Because that's what it means to really be a Christian. Right? And be giving your life to Jesus. All right, now, it says God wants to use these uh, reliable people. And he's going to use them in his kingdom mission. 
to rescue people from captivity to darkness and sin and evil. People who are slaves to sin need to be liberated. He's gonna use them to help redeem people and liberate them. But who are these reliable people that God will use? Are you one of them? How would you know? What do they look like? How can you tell? And how can you become one? One of these reliable people that God wants to use to change the world. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're asking that question because that's what chapter 2 is about. And we're given some uh, metaphors here to describe uh, the kind of people that God uses. Okay, here's the first metaphor. It's like a dedicated soldier. So let me go back to the beginning of chapter 2. The things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Here's what those reliable people look like. First metaphor, they're like good soldiers. Verse 3. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Okay, so be a good soldier. Now, when you think about soldier, that's a high commitment. Some of you have been in the military, you know that. A lot of us have not been in the military, but we recognize that when you're in the military, there's a calling on your life, and it calls for your full devotion. In fact, uh, you know, when there's a war and a battle and people are sent to, into battle, did you ever notice this? There's no part-time soldiers. It's not like, oh, yeah, I'll go out and fight from 9 to 12 in the morning, take a lunch break, and then go home. It's not that, right? It's full-time. It's all in. It's going all out. Paul here says, be like a good soldier willing to suffer. Willing to suffer. He says, um, Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. So what, what does it mean to be a dedicated soldier? First thing, I've got to be willing to suffer. And are you willing to suffer for Jesus? Or am I just a convenience Christian, a consumeristic Christian? Give me the goods, give me the goods for the least expense possible on my part, right? The least cost, right? So Jesus says, no, you've got to count the cost. Jesus says, if anyone wants to become my disciple... Let that person deny themselves, <clears throat> take up their cross, and come follow me. He even says, if you desire to save your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake or give your life for my sake, you're going to find it. Meaning, you're going to find the life that is life indeed. So dedicated soldiers, they're willing to suffer. He also says they've got to be undistracted. And did, did you see that there uh, in verse 4? No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. In other words, you've got to be dedicated. You've got to be focused. There's no part-time soldiers on the front lines of battle. He says you've got to keep yourself unentangled. One of the dangers in the church today is that many of us are entangled. You know what I mean? Uh, what is it that occupies your thought, your energy, your time? Uh, is it things that um, are helping you to grow in Jesus and become more like him? Or are they things that are entangling you, right? that are distracting you or holding you back. So dedicated soldiers willing to suffer, undistracted, they're dedicated, they're focused, they're unentangled, and also this, they're devoted to the cause and to the commander. They're devoted to the cause and to the commander. And so again, you, you see that there in uh, chapter two, verse four, where he says, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. And we are under orders from our great chief commander, and his name is Jesus. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. And if I'm gonna be a Christian, I've gotta know who I work for, who I serve. I've told some of you this before. My first uh, ministry position on a church staff uh, was in Anaheim, California, right by Disneyland. No Mickey Mouse ministry, though. <laughs> but I was uh, on staff there, uh, halftime, and uh, it was difficult. And I, I, I learned that, uh, man, ministry is not uh, for the faint of heart or not for the feeble. <laughs> okay. And I also learned this, that I have to always be clear that although I'm hired by the church and my salary comes from the church, that ultimately I work for the Lord. There were times in that church, and, and I loved the church, and it was a wonderful church, and I had a wonderful experience there for the most part. But there were times, <laughs> you know what I mean, there were times where I felt uh, undervalued, unfairly criticized, unappreciated. You know what that's called? That's called ministry. That's part of it. That's part of the game, right? But, but me, and I was in my 20s, and, and uh, in my youthful zeal, 
I would get disillusioned, like, man, I'm only here because God called me, and I'm just trying to love on these people. I'm trying to serve them. Why do I feel like, you know, they're, they're undervaluing me and not appreciating me? And uh, I started to, I can confess it now all these years later, I started to kind of get resentful toward the church. I started to feel some resentment toward the leaders of the church for not treating me the way I, I wanted to be treated. And, and, you know, when you start feeling resentful, it's kind of like a little spiritual poison that enters your system, right? And, and I, some of you have been there, and the resentment can grow. It can become grudges. It can become bitterness. It can become cynicism. But I started to feel a little resentful toward the church because I felt like, hey, they're not compensating me fairly, and, you know, they, they say they like my ministry, but I felt like they weren't always treating me that way. <laughs> anyway, here's what I want to share with you. As the resentment, the seed of resentment started to grow in my heart, the Lord spoke to me. And this is what the Lord said. As he often does, he asked me a question. And the Lord asked me this question, Wayne, who do you work for? And I thought, oh. I started thinking I work for the church, and so I'm resenting the church because I'm not happy as an employee. The Lord asked me that question, who do you work for? Maybe he's asking you that question today. Who do you work for? And if you work for the Lord, then I would say this. I think it's okay. If you've got a complaint, take it up with the boss. Pray to him. And so I started having this dialogue with the Lord, and I realized, you know, years earlier when I, you know, was a young Christian, I, I made this a commitment to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I was 18 years old when I made this promise to Jesus. I'll go anywhere you want me to go, and I'll do anything you want me to do if you'll just stay with me. I'll go anywhere you want me to go. It was a scary promise to make, but I was challenged to make it, and I did. I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. I'll do anything you want me to do if you'll just stay with me. And I never had any idea that I would move out of Southern California where I grew up. I had no thought that I would become a pastor or go into full-time ministry, but I did make that commitment when I was 18 years old. And you know what? The Lord has always stayed with me. And he's taken care of me. And so when I was starting to feel resentful toward the church because I, you know, I felt like you know, I wasn't being treated well, uh, the Lord said, who do you work for? And I said, well, Lord, I work for you. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> Tough reminder, but I, you know, thanks for the reminder. I work for you. And actually, you have always taken care of me. And I, you know, I haven't had all that I wanted, and life was not easy but he'd always been there for me just as he promised, and he'd always taken care of me. And so, I, you know, that, that really did liberate me from some of the uh, resentment that had started to grow in my soul. All right, so uh, dedicated soldiers, you, you've got to know who you work for. You've got to know who you serve. And right there, he says, uh, you know, one thing about soldiers, they can't get entangled in civilian affairs, but they've got to focus on trying to please their commanding officer. Okay, that's the first metaphor. I just want to see, if we want to be a reliable person that God uses, uh, be a dedicated soldier, be a good soldier. Okay, second metaphor is disciplined athletes. Disciplined athletes. Similar, anyone who competes as an athlete, this is verse five, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So we all know this, that the Olympics are about to start, I think in, what is it, a week or two? And uh, that nobody gets to be an Olympic athlete without years of training, of sacrifice, of discipline, right? So that's the picture here of a disciplined athlete, and they've got to compete according to the rules. Now, when I was growing up, I was a, a big fan of the Los Angeles Rams. You ever heard of them? And tomorrow they're going to play in the NFC Championship game. And uh, when I was about 30 years old... Big changes in my life happened. One big change was I got married. Second big change was I left Southern California and moved to Northern California. A third big change was, uh, I, obviously, I left my ministry in Anaheim, and I became the pastor of a church in Berkeley, California. But the other big change that happened was uh, I converted from the Rams to the 49ers. <laughs> I did. And it was surprisingly easy <laughs> at that time. <laughs> But I became a big-time 49er fan. These were the days of Joe Montana and Jerry Rice and later Steve Young. And every year we were on the quest for the holy grail of the Super Bowl, a little bit like the Seahawks now. You know, like almost every year you make the playoffs and you're in that quest for the holy grail of the Super Bowl title. But anyway, tomorrow, well, I mean, this is Saturday where we're 
life, but um, Sunday, the 49ers and the Rams are going to play each other, and the winner will go to the Super Bowl. So who are you rooting for? 49ers? How many of you want the Rams to win? Okay, how many of you want the 49ers to win? Yeah, how many wish the Seahawks were in that game? Yeah, okay. All right, so this is the thing I want us to see, though. Every team has a playbook, right? And you know who gets the playbook? The members of the team, right? In fact, there's a lot of secret plays in there that other people are not supposed to see. But if you're going to play for one of those teams, and if your team is going to, you know, be victorious, you've got to play on the playbook, right? What if everybody just says, oh, yeah, I don't like the coach's playbook. I think I'll just make my own, or I think I'll just change it here and there. And after a while, the team's not playing on the same playbook, and they're not going to be successful. Okay, so here's the image that, that uh, Paul's giving us in verse 5. He says, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. And that's true with the Olympics. We always hear about Olympic athletes that are disqualified because of performance enhancing, enhancing drugs or some other way that they've cheated. And we know this about football, that you've got to, the whole team's got to be on the same playbook. Now, should that be any less for the Church of Jesus Christ? We also have a playbook. Uh, it's called the Bible. And we've got to be on the same playbook, right? We've got to learn God's rules, God's ways, God's commands, and follow them. And that's how you become a healthy Christian, a vibrant, growing Christian, right? And that's how we be, maintain uh, our ability to be a unified, healthy church. We all got the same playbook, and we've got to be really learning that playbook and following it, and that's the Word of God. We follow God's playbook so that we're all on the same page, and we're, we're understanding and hearing the, the divine coach's instructions, and we're trying to play out this life according to his rules. They're called laws, according to his commandments. Okay, so you want to be a reliable person that God can use, be a dedicated soldier, but also be like the disciplined athlete who plays according to the rules, who lives by the book. And that's really vital. I love that about this church is that uh, most of us, we don't question the Bible is God's word. Now, we may debate sometimes about particular interpretations of specific passages, but if we ever lose this uh, conviction and commitment to the Bible as the authority and God's word, we're in trouble. And I, you, you probably too. I, I've seen so many churches that have gotten in trouble because they no longer have that unifying conviction that the Bible is God's word. It is our authority in all matters of faith and practice. And we submit ourselves to the authority of God as he reveals his will through the scriptures. That's going to be very vital for enduring leadership. That's going to be very vital in the months and the years ahead. All right. Uh, disciplined athletes follow God's playbook. Uh, the third image that, that he's given us is diligent farmers, and we get that one. Verse 6, the hardworking farmers should be the first to receive a share of the crops. And, you know, <laughs> did any of you grow up on a farm? How many of you grew up on a farm? Okay, almost none of us. <laughs> okay, but we know this, that if you grow up on a farm, you often have to do a lot of work with your parents, right? And... Um, Farming is hard work, right? And, and, and there's no easy way, you know, to, to grow and harvest a, a good crop. And so I would say this, the Christian life in some ways is like farming in the sense of this. You've got to work hard. Sometimes you've got to make sacrifices. You've got to be diligent. You, you, you've got to be obedient where you, whether you feel like it or not. You ever think about this? Every farmer, I guess this is true with gardeners too, uh, gardens or farms in faith. Right? It was you do things in faith. You, know, you, you plant the seed, you water, you fertilize, you weed. Uh, you do all that in faith because you don't see immediate results, right? But you do it in faith that if I do the right things, there's going to be good harvest later, good fruit, right? And, and uh, the Bible also often gives us this image that if you're going to follow Jesus, it's kind of like you're a farmer. You've got to sow in faith, right? You pray even though you don't see the results right away. You read the Bible and study the word. You try to obey God when he asks you to do something costly, right? To give up what he wants you to give up, to commit to doing what he wants you to do. And, and we say, oh, but I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know. You, you live in faith. We walk by faith and not by sight, right? So we've got the playbook, and we should be disciplined and live according to the rules, God's rules. We're to be dedicated soldiers, undistracted, willing to suffer, and just seeking to please our commanding officer, the Lord God himself, the Lord Jesus. And we're to be like diligent farmers, uh, hardworking and uh, diligent. 
Okay, so now I want, to, I want us to go on in chapter 8 here. And I, I'm chapter 2, 2 Timothy 2. And I want us to look at verses uh, 8 to 10 for a moment. Remember Jesus Christ. Now, whatever you remember affects you, right? Like, oh, did you remember to pick up the kids? Oh, we have kids? <laughs> remember, remember Jesus Christ. Raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel. Now, he says, this is my gospel. This is my message. Basically, it's all about Jesus. It's a reminder to us that our gospel, our message is all about Jesus. That we, what we need is a Christocentric message. It's all about Jesus. And the gospel is centered in Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And if we're Christians, we are all about Jesus. And one of the things that means is we are not afraid to name his name. We are not ashamed to be Christians. We're not the secret agent Christians like nobody knows. Ooh, I love being a stealth Christian. You know what a stealth Christian is? An unfaithful one. Right? Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. Salt influences, right? Salt makes things tastier, better. Salt preserves. Right? You're the salt. You're the light. Okay, so I want us to see this, that we've got to remember Jesus Christ and have a Christ-centered faith and not be afraid to name his name. In fact, it's a little pet peeve of mine. I often hear people pray and then at the end of the prayer, they say, and we pray in his name. And the whole prayer, they never mention his name. So we get that. We understand what the person is saying. But I feel like, wow, the whole prayer didn't even mention Jesus or Christ. And then at the end, we say, and we pray in his name. I think, wow, we ought to be able to <coughs> mention his name. All right. Excuse me. Whose water is this? <clears throat> All right, three more metaphors. Three more metaphors uh, in verses 14 to 26, okay? So we said, you know, the first three metaphors, dedicated soldiers, disciplined athletes, diligent farmers. Now, who are these reliable people that God wants to use? They are also called unashamed workers. This is 14 to 19, verses 14 to 19, unashamed workers. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Uh, about the gospel and about the danger of false teaching. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It's of no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter. This verse 16 sounds a lot like verse 14. Right? Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have departed from the truth, they say that the resurrection has already taken place. In other words, that there's no future resurrection for believers, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. Now, it says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker approved. And a worker approved is someone who does not need to be ashamed and who is not ashamed of Jesus and uh, who, co who correctly handles the word of truth. In other words, really tries to understand the scripture accurately and explain it accurately. Uh, we're even told here in verse uh, 14 and verse 16 that a lot of talk is harmful. A lot of talk is harmful. I just read this morning about how Neil Young and Joni Mitchell have both pulled all their music off Spotify because of some harmful speech that uh, one of the podcasts on Spotify is, is saying. And you can make up your own opinion about, about what they're doing. But I understand, whether you agree with what they did or not, that in their view, there's some very harmful speech and misinformation regarding vaccinations. And, and in protest against that harmful speech, they have decided we're going to pull our music off Spotify, at least for now. Uh, but we recognize this, that a lot of talk is harmful. Here we're told it can ruin those who listen, and it can move people toward greater and greater ungodliness. You ever heard speech like that? I think if you listen to the media, you're going to hear speech like that every single day. It ruins those who listen and grows people toward ungodliness. Wrong teaching, verse 17 says, wrong teaching can spread like gangrene and destroy people's faith, verse 18. 
Okay, so there's a real danger here. So what we need is right teaching. Unashamed workers are people that stick close to Scripture, that stand with the Word of God, and that understand it and then speak forth the Word of God. And then we're told in verse 19, God's solid foundation stands firm. Now, the foundation here probably refers to Christ. He is the foundation. But there's a sense in which the, the church is also the foundation, the bulwark of the truth, we're told in 1 Timothy. So I want you to think about this. Here's what we're told. Here's the solid foundation we can stand on. Two aspects in verse 19. On one hand, the Lord knows those who are his. And I think that's supposed to help us to feel secure in our identity in Christ. Other people may not understand us. They may mistreat us. They may reject us. They may ridicule us. But the Lord knows those who are his. So if you're his, you belong to him because you've given your life to him. Stand firm in your identity. Other people may say, oh, you're good for nothing and you're not worth much and you'll never amount to nothing or anything. But the Lord knows those who are his. So, so rest securely in your identity in Jesus. But the other thing it says in verse 19 is everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. So being secure in my identity is no excuse for laziness or compromise or sin. Right? Sometimes you say, oh, I, I know I'm God's child. I can do anything I want. I just know God will forgive me, right? So I, I think we've got to balance this. I love this in verse 19. Here's the foundation. It's a foundation of grace. The Lord knows those who are his. And it's a foundation of truth that anybody who confesses the name of Jesus must turn away from wickedness. We are called to righteousness, right? We're called to righteousness. All right. Now, we're talking about these uh, metaphors, right? The dedicated soldier, the disciplined athlete, the diligent farmer. The fourth one is unashamed workers, who are approved by God, who are focused on his truth. And then uh, the fifth metaphor, <laughs> think about this, it's clean instruments, clean instruments or clean utensils. It's in verse 20 to 22. In a large house, there are articles or instruments or utensils. There are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and hay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes made holy, useful to the master, prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, here's what he's saying. You want to be a reliable person that's being used by God to help liberate other people and help further the cause of Christ and help bring light into a dark world. You want to be one of those people? You got to be a clean instrument, an instrument for special purposes. And he describes those instruments, those, those people that want to be those clean instruments. He says they are holy, useful, and prepared. Holy, useful, and prepared. Uh, prepared to do any good work. So what does it mean to be holy? Sometimes we think, oh, does it mean to be perfect? No. Does it mean to be sinless? No. To be holy means to be sanctified, to be set aside for God. So if you, you say, you know, Lord, here's my life. I set it aside. I dedicate it to you. To be holy means to be set aside for God, set apart for God and for his use. So he says these clean instruments, they are going to be holy. They're going to be sanctified. They're going to be set apart for God, dedicated to him. Uh, they're also going to be useful. And, you know, some Christians are useful and some Christians are useless. But the useful ones are saying, Lord, here am I. Use me, right? <laughs> And then, and then they're going to be holy and useful, and they're going to be prepared for every good work. And, of course, we get prepared for every good work by the Word of God, through the influence of the people of God. This is the church, through prayer, right? So uh, clean instruments, holy, useful, prepared. And then he says, flee the evil desires of youth. He doesn't mention what they are here. We often think, well, is that sexual immorality? That's a common evil desire of youth, but not just youth, right? It could be greed. It could be a, just a, a kind of a, a selfish ambition. But, you know, you fill that in for yourself. Flee the evil desires of youth. And not just youth have some evil desires. But instead, flee one thing and instead pursue something positive. Pursue righteousness, right? Love, faith, peace. These are actually, if you ever think about this, these are four marks of, a, of Christian maturity, aren't they? Four marks of Christian maturity. Righteousness. Righteous, to be righteous just means uh, as it should be. Righteous is like right standing before God, right relationship with God, right living, 
for God, righteousness. To live as it should be, as God wants you to live. And faith and love and peace. Okay? So, I'm saying, talking about these, these metaphors, right? Uh, unash- unashamed workers, clean instruments. Uh, let me mention one more before we close. Okay? If you want to be a reliable person that's used by God to liberate other people and help them find their way and help them find life in Jesus, uh, you've got to be an unashamed worker, a clean instrument. The, the last one here is gentle servants. Gentle servants. Verses 23 to 26. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. Okay, that's all around us, especially on social media. <laughs> okay. uh, verse 24. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. It could be translated patient there. Kind to everyone, able to teach, and patient. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Okay, so gentle servants, the Lord's servants, they are kind to everyone. I kind of wish it didn't say everyone. Like, kind, you know, I, some people I can be kind to, but it's hard to be kind to everyone. I'm going to need the grace of God to be able to do that, right? Kind to everyone, able to teach, and, and your role in the church may not be to be a teacher, but everybody who's been given the word of God is then supposed to share the word of God in whatever way. It may just be with a coworker, like, hey, you know, God showed me something in the scriptures this morning in my quiet time. And, you know, it's really helping me when I think about the task we have at work today. Uh, can I share that verse with you? That's teaching, right? Uh, sometimes we text people. And we say, hey, I'm praying for you. Maybe I can send a, a little scripture with them, with that that's going to encourage them because I know what they're going through. But able to teach, able to share God's word. Okay, so gentle sh- uh, servants, the Lord's servants, uh, are kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. And, oh, that's, it's good that that's in there because sometimes we can be just as resentful as anybody else, right? Indignant, uh, self-righteous, not resentful or patient. And then also gently correcting opponents, right? That's in the next verse. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth and that God will set them free. This beautiful thing that we are called to, to, to be instruments in the hand of God to help people find freedom in Christ and to find, help people find forgiveness through Christ and for them to find hope and meaning and purpose in life through Christ. And we can be those reliable people that God uses as instruments in his hands. Right? Like Watchman Nee said, he said, to be used by God to fulfill his purpose, to do his work is better than a lifetime of human striving. To be used by God to do his work is better than a lifetime of human striving. And God wants to use you and me. And don't say, who, me, not me. It's you. It's you in Christ. All right? Okay. That's it. Dedicated soldiers, disciplined athletes, diligent farmers, unashamed workers, clean instruments, and gentle servants. And here's the fruit. Here's the fruit. Again, verse 26, uh, verse 25 and 26. You do all these things, including confronting false teaching, in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. There is even hope for those false teachers at Ephesus, right? That God would grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. We are the forces of liberation, and God wants to use us, but we're going to have to be reliable people. Well, Lord, thank you for teaching us, and thank you that you do want to use us. Thank you, Lord, for the liberation and the freedom that we are finding in Christ, but we know so many who don't know that freedom, who are still living in darkness, who are actually captive to the evil one, and cannot help but do the will of the evil one. And so, Lord, we pray today that you would set us free and that will you, you will use us to liberate and set free others. Thank you, Jesus. I pray in your name, the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. All right, we're preparing our hearts for communion, and Pastor Nancy's going to come and lead us.
Thanks, Pastor Wayne. Just for the reminder of what it means to be uh, followers of Christ, to be uh, those reliable uh, witnesses and uh, God's call in our lives um, to be people of good news. Well, we have this privilege of celebrating uh, communion this morning, and uh, we ask if you haven't yet uh, received some packets, communion packets, you can receive one from the usher in the back. And also, if you're worshiping with us at home, we just invite you to prepare your elements as well. Now, communion is uh, a sacred practice of the church established by Jesus himself as he gathered uh, with his disciples, his faithful ones, on the night that he had his final meal with them, knowing that in just a few hours he would be arrested, um, brutally beaten and crucified on the cross for their sake, for yours as well as for mine. But, you know, Jesus knew that on the third day he would be raised again, uh, resurrected by the power of God, and, and his followers would finally understand the, the true significance of his life, death, and resurrection. So as we partake and participate in communion this morning, we remember Jesus' story. We remember who he is, what he has done for us, and we remember the depth of his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. We also celebrate that by his sacrificial death on the cross, Jesus broke the power of sin, evil, and death in this world and in our own hearts. And he enabled us to be forgiven, to be set free, to be healed and made whole through faith in him. So here we read in Luke chapter 22 that on the night Jesus was uh, betrayed, he, he gathered those closest to him and he took the bread, he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. In doing so, he was declaring the promise of new life that anyone who would put their trust in him would have this, this new life that would enable us to live as those reliable people, that would enable us to love as he loved. So as we partake in communion today, we remember not only Jesus' death, but also his resurrection and the new life we now have in him. So those of you who um, have this new life, who belong to Jesus, who have declared your faith in him, are invited to partake of the bread and the juice as we affirm our faith in Jesus. And if you are here today or watching on, online, if you have not yet, put your trust in Jesus, we invite you also to partake with us as a sign of a dedication of your faith in Jesus Christ. So now as we prepare our hearts, just want to invite you um, to receive the bread and the cup. Let's partake together. Jesus, today we are just reminded again what you have done for us, how you sacrificed your life for us to give us a new life, how you continue to live within us to heal and restore our own lives and the lives of those around us. Lord, we thank you today that you pour your spirit into each of us. You give us your power, your resurrection power to be declarers of your good news, to be that faithful follower, that the dedicated farmers and soldiers and athletes, 
to say no to the pull of darkness and say yes to the light and life that you modeled for us and you call us to live out in this world, to be messengers of liberation, to declare that there is hope in you that, that breaks the power of darkness, that there is life, true life, that overflows in our hearts if we would turn our hearts towards you. So we pray that today, God, make us those reliable witnesses, those reliable, faithful ones that you are sending into the world to declare your goodness, to declare your power, to declare your grace that changes this world. But we want to be part of that. Send us out now in the power of your blood and in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray all these things. Amen. sing one more song to close.
All right, while you're still standing, let's receive the benediction, which comes to us today from Hebrews chapter 13. And now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may God equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Okay, thanks. If you have a seat. Uh, if you're with us online, I've heard that some people tune out or turn off when the announcements come up, but I want you to stay for the announcements today if you can. Uh, next week, a week from today, is going to be our Lighthouse 21st anniversary. So we're preparing for that service. If you can come in person, please join us. If you want to join us online, uh, we will, of course, put the service online uh, the next day as well. Uh, in two weeks from today, we're going to have a membership class. So if you're interested in learning more about Lighthouse and what it means to be a member here, uh, come join us for lunch at the Lighthouse Center. It's going to be Saturday, February 12th from 12.30 to 2.30 p.m. Saturday, February 12th, from 12.30 to 2.30 p.m., lunch at the Lighthouse. However, we need you to RSVP. So if you would RSVP uh, info at lighthousechristian.church, that would be great. Okay? Now, uh, as you know, big transitions uh, coming up in our church, and I want to have Tim Sneath from our transition team come up and give us an update. Give him a hand. Thanks, Tim. Thank you so much, Pastor Wayne. Well, good morning. As uh, Pastor Wayne's mentioned, uh, my name's Tim Sneath. I've got my badge on, like we all should. Um, I'm a member of the transition team, and we've been working to help the church prepare for this upcoming transition as we begin to welcome Pastor Joe uh, Castillo as our new uh, lead pastor. And so uh, between the staff, the elders, the transition team, We've been working together to develop different plans to get us ready for this transition. And I don't know about you, but different people may be feeling slightly different feelings about this transition, depending on how long you've been here, how well you know Pastor Joe. And so transition is a tough thing for us to go through as a church. It always means uh, working through things together. And so we've got three, three, three things uh, for us to kind of help us uh, work through the uh, transition process. So number one... We have an eight-week uh, message series and uh, small group study called Walking with God in Seasons of Change. And everyone is invited, welcome, encouraged to join us and participate uh, as we begin in mid-February. And if you're not already a member of a small group, we have three new small groups that are starting up um, to focus on this. So you can come along uh, in this journey with us. Number two... We have a one-day in-person retreat coming up on Saturday, April 30th. So mark your calendar, Saturday, April 30th. Uh, and that's going to be at the Sambika camp. And that's also going to be focused on managing transitions. And the idea of that is to help us connect and process and experience uh, transition together as a church community as we uh, look forward towards the transition. And then number three... There are going to be a number of opportunities for those of you who perhaps don't know Joe so well or have questions or other things you want to, to discuss um, to get to know him better. And so Pastor Joe is going to be visiting various discipleship groups and small groups. Um, you can join a fellowship gathering with Pastor Joe in Zoom uh, or in person, depending on how you prefer. You can go for a walk with him. He apparently likes to do walks with people. So if you want to go on a, a walk, that's possible. I've got written here dessert, which sounds like a good option to me. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah, a good chance to get to know him. And he would just, I think, openly encourage folk to reach out to, uh, to say hi. And then thirdly, we have some monthly transition updates and blogs. We're working on um, some communications over the next couple of months to just reintroduce Pastor Joe to you if you don't know him so well. So look out for more information on all this at the website and through our weekly emails. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Tim. And we appreciate the good work that the transition team is doing there. They've been very diligent to help prepare our church for a healthy uh, leadership transition. Okay. Um, Thank you for your generosity in supporting Lighthouse with your finances, your tithes, and your offerings. Uh, we're very grateful for your faithful stewardship of your finances. And if you'd like to give, there's a box in the back. You can put a check there or a, 
or cash, I guess, if you have any cash. <laughs> and you can always give online, but thank you for your stewardship. Also, if you want to receive prayer, we're going to have some people to pray for you right up here in front of the curtain here. And uh, you can always receive prayer uh, through online, too. And um, let's see, would you wear your name tag if you come? That'd be great. Help us get to know each other. And thanks for wearing your masks. And uh, before you go, would you try to meet somebody that you didn't already know? And that'd be very cool. Have a blessed week. Hope to see you next week.